Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's call will feature a question and answer period. At that time, if you'd like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star, then 1 on your phone. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to turn today's call over to Ms. Holly Kirkendall. You may begin. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome everyone to today's East National Technology Support Center webinar. Uh, we're excited to have you here and uh, looking forward to a big year in 2012. This is our first uh, webinar of the calendar year. On the screen, you'll notice that we have a pretty robust uh, schedule coming up in 2012. I want to express our uh, appreciation to more than 600 people that responded to our survey to help determine the topics that we'll present this year. Thanks, everybody, for participating. And these were the topics, uh, they're not necessarily in rank order, but these are the topics that ranked out the highest. And we had several uh, topics that ranked really high for pasture and also for irrigation water management, so we're opting to have two mini-series for those two topics. So you'll notice that in February, the essential principles for conservation planning on pastures is scheduled, but that'll be the first of a mini-series that's uh, being scheduled now. And same situation in May for sensor-based irrigation water management. We'll have a mini-series for that uh, uh, soil water plant interactions relationships uh, series that will kick off in May. So that's what we've got going on in the coming year. Uh, also, we started a little campaign to make sure people know about us and know about our webinars and all the great things that we're doing here at the center. So this week we launched our Twitter site. So if you'll take note of our Twitter address, we would uh, appreciate your following us. And I hope at the end of the webinar today, after the next couple of days, we can have maybe 20, at least 20 of y'all follow us on Twitter. Uh, what you'll find is that we've got information about some of our technical documents, our website, we'll have webinar announcements, and we'll have just all kinds of information on the Twitter site that you can uh, take advantage of. So please take note of our address. Uh, for today's webinar, you can ask questions by going to the Q&A button that's on the uh, menu bar. Uh, we'll have uh, questions at the end of the presentation through the operator, and you can get assistance for asking a question through the operator using star one. Or you can use the Q&A box on the menu where you just type in a little chat question and we'll answer those as we go, or we'll hold the technical questions for Kale at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's presentation, again, is presented by Kale Gullett. He's our fisheries biologist here at the Tech Center. His topic is stream habitat management, assessing stream condition, and he moved it off the screen. What? There it is. And identifying management options. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kale's ready to go. All right, Kale, take it away. All right, hold on here. Start getting some of these buttons pushed. Hopefully everybody's still on the line. And if I get my end of this whole interface ready to go, we can get started. All right, so hello, and uh, thanks for the introduction, Holly. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying thanks to the folks out there that uh, provided input and, and expressed some interest in this. It's, uh, it's a topic that's uh, been a big part of my life for quite a few years. Um, so today I hope to provide some insight into the world of stream habitat management. And as with other webinars, I'll go over a lot of material without the luxury of much detail. So please feel free to contact me at any time uh, if you want to further talk about this stuff or get, in, get information on anything I talk about today. So I should start out with an apology of sorts. Uh, much of what I'm about to go over assumes some familiarity with concepts of hydrology, fluvial geomorphology, and river ecology. Uh, I'm planning to do another webinar this July that covers basic principles in terms in those two sciences, uh, specifically aimed at non-engineers. Um, it's sort of the cart before the horse here, but it's an artifact of the choreography of these things and the order in which I propose some topics. So I'll try to minimize the use of jargon as much as I can, uh, but some will be necessary. So regardless of your level of expertise or educational experience uh, r related with rivers, I think most people have a gut reaction to how a stream looks when they first visit a site. A little voice in your head says, this seems pretty nice, or, wow, what happened here? 
or just plain wow. Uh, and sometimes this qualitative reaction can be spot on as far as judging stream condition. Sometimes streams are messy and what we think is fairly degraded might be relatively predictable or expected. Sometimes what looks like good habitat is actually an ecological desert. By just about any definition, rivers and streams are systems, and many systems are simple machines that manage power to accomplish a task. In this context, the primary task rivers are responsible for is landscape change. Gravity is the basic energy source. Water does most of the work, and rocks, soil, streamside vegetation, and large woody debris provide some resistance to erosional processes. I want to touch on something that I think gets overlooked or under underemphasized when it comes to work associated in and around rivers, and that's floodplains. Most rivers have floodplains of varying magnitudes, and evidence of prior channel positions over time can often be seen uh, in aerial photography. In landscapes with a long and extensive history of development, uh, society tends to forget about floodplains, and reminders can often be sudden and painful, as seen in the Northeast last summer when Hurricane Irene swept up the coast. Here, the road fill defined the lateral extent of the floodplain, and the main channel of the river could have easily ended up in the middle of this farm field. The river put that material there, and it can basically return for it at any time. In any discussion of river function, channel stability, and habitat quality, floodplains can't be uncoupled or considered separately from the river channel. So, river channels and floodplains are coupled together, but it takes time to make that connection. When you consider any drainage basin with a river running down through it, a number of variables regulate how that river will look, what animals will live in and around it, and what vegetation will grow alongside it at any point downstream. A few large-scale physical sideboards dictate the, the way river basins look and function. Climate, geology, and the physical geography of a watershed govern the amount of water and sediment a river will process on any given day of the year. River channel and floodplain geometry adjust themselves to the prevailing precipitation and sediment regime, and vegetation helps to moderate the magnitude of these adjustments. In simplest terms, uh, river systems can be broken down into three component parts within a given watershed, and each interacts with and is driven mostly by gravity, water, water <coughs> excuse me, and the material it carries. However, in each zone at all scales, river systems must find a way to expend excess energy and maintain equilibrium. Zone 1, or the headwaters and uppermost reaches of a stream, serve as the supply zone. Erosional processes are most pronounced here as surface landforms are often younger. Climate precipitation and topography are at the extreme end of the spectrum, and gravity is steeper across smaller spatial scales. Zone 2, also known as the transfer zone, is where rivers really begin to respond to materials delivered from upstream reaches. Floodplains become much more extensive, channel morphology can be diverse, and streamside vegetation plays a bigger role in floodplain and channel structure and function. Finally, Zone 3, or the deposition zone, is where we see the largest rivers in a given landscape, extensive floodplains, uh, oftentimes high species diversity with respect to plant and animal communities, and it's where we usually see a receiving water body that serves as the ultimate base level for the system. So assuming that river systems are organized from headwaters on downstream, we can make some generalizations about the architecture of any river along its course. As you move downstream, slope and the average size of bed material decreases. Stream flow, channel width, depth, and average velocities increase. And in addition, the average amount of sediment stored in the channel and floodplain increases, as does the relative influence of vegetation on channel and floodplain form. So when applied to any larger geographic region, you can make broad scale assumptions about river zonation and general architecture. So if you consider Virginia, which is basically uh, has mountains in the west, a broad Piedmont along the middle, and a coastal plain down the eastern margin, can also describe it as containing five physiographic provinces, and then the state could be broken up into broad categories of erosion, transport, and deposition as you move from west to east. Drilling down, you can assume a template for average sediment size according to the physiography and changes in river architecture. Uh, larger material in the steeper parts of the state transitions to smaller sediments along coastal depositional environments. Channel slope and width can be generalized as well. Steep, narrow channels widen and become flatter as you move toward the ocean. Floodplain and riparian complexes also change from west to east, ranging from relatively narrow bands composed of a few species to extensive swaths covered by, covered by a broad, 
broad range of vegetation at the coast. Excuse me. So combining all those things, sediment, slope, vegetation, helps give insight into the range of possible channel patterns. In broad terms, channels in mountainous regions are dominated by coarse sediment and woody debris forest morphology, with, which transitions to meandering streams bracketed by sometimes extensive floodplains, floored with finer depositional materials, all held together by a complex mosaic of floodplain riparian vegetation. So when you think about a drainage basin in your area and get a mental picture of how a river changes from its headwaters on down, hopefully you'll agree that there are some general similarities amongst streams across landforms in a watershed. Up high, there are steeper, uh, larger bed materials, less developed floodplains. And as you move down the watershed, slopes even out, rivers get bigger, substrate sizes largely decrease, uh, floodplains are more pronounced, and vegetation changes with the prevailing conditions. Again, floodplains shouldn't be uncoupled from stream channels in any discussion about rivers. Twenty years ago, I think the influence of riparian vegetation on channel morphology wasn't really given the attention it deserved, but streamside trees recruited into a channel as it interacts with its floodplain strongly influence how a river channel looks and processes water and sediment. Floodplain vegetation also plays a big role in creating and maintaining floodplain surfaces. This photo shows fine sediment deposition on a floodplain after an overbank flow event. When channel changes occur, floodplain vegetation also influences bed load deposition. This coarse sediment was deposited as a plug behind a log jam at the head of a former channel following a flood. Over time, this depositional wedge may be colonized by vegetation, but it definitely serves as a sediment storage site that influences system stability. And in many river settings, stands of native trees like these water tupelo have roots that do a heck of a job maintaining bank stability and channel morphology. So all the stuff I've just covered, relationships between geology, physiography, sediment slope, woody material, provide the basis for many of the river classification schemes out there that attempt to categorize and describe channel configuration. I think these are some of the most common schemes that you'll encounter, and each has its strengths and weaknesses, and their foundations range from process-based models to snapshots of channel morphology at the time you visit a site. So expected or reasonably predictable channel and floodplain features take long periods of time to develop. Uh, given slope and precipitation, you can generate a channel relatively quickly, as shown here after a forest fire. Although this channel has well-defined banks and is floored with sediment, you'd be hard-pressed to find repeated diagnostic elements that fit the channel according to many of the classification schemes shown in the preceding slide. It takes time for river channels and floodplains to organize themselves and reach equilibrium. Conversely, it often doesn't take much time to upset that equilibrium. Over time, river systems tend to reach a balance between stream flow and the material it carries, mostly sediment and wood. Many of you have seen this little ditty, which is known as Lane's Balance, is originally used by the Bureau of Reclamation in the design of stable channels. This simple tool illustrates how altering any one of four components forces channel adjustment because predictability and stability are dependent on a proportionality between the load and size of sediment and the slope and stream flow of a system. Now for a little bit about stream flow. Uh, stream systems are created and maintained by precipitation that results in runoff and stream flow. Uh, none of the classification uh, methods I mentioned previously uh, blatantly include metrics that describe or incorporate the flow regime of a given river, even though the variables they all consider are dependent on a range of stream flow over time. Stream flow is the master variable with respect to its influence on river systems and habitat. Uh, there are virtually no elements of the physical, biological, or chemical structure and function of a river system that can't be linked to it. Sediment, riparian vegetation, both live and dead, and watershed conditions such as slope and geology govern or throttle the amount of work a river can accomplish. Precipitation that gets into the ground at all locations in a watershed returns to stream channels throughout the year, keeping streams and riparian areas going during times of low or no precipitation. So streams integrate all that happens upslope, and watershed processes create and maintain river systems. Interactions between numerous physical, biological, chemical, and human factors affect the way a river looks and functions, and influences what we refer to as habitat for aquatic and streamside vegetation. 
So I've talked about and around the word habitat, and now I think we have the basis to provide a working definition. For today's purposes, let's use this. Stream habitat is biological reliance on physical features in a stream. As a physical feature, substrate acts as the channel boundary, holds its position, and helps expend stream energy as roughness. In a habitat sense, it serves as substrate for the base of the food web that sustains populations of larger vertebrates. In a population sense, substrate supports the reproduction of a number of different aquatic animals. In fact, without a proper arrangement and availability of certain sizes of substrates, some populations can't make it. Now, stream habitat is a general term, and I bet if you were to ask five aquatic biologists the same question, that is, what is aquatic habitat, you'd get at least four different answers. Now, I've used this definition in the past. It has its place, but it's sort of clunky. However, some key elements of this definition are collective, spatial, and temporal. Collective because the habitat in any river is used by more than one species with numerous life histories. Spatial because habitat varies at all scales in a river. And temporal because habitat changes naturally over time and species need time to develop and maintain a population. Since habitat is biological reliance on physical features in a stream, it's good to use another discipline that ties together the physical and hydrologic components of a river. That discipline is river ecology. And one useful aspect of considering things from an ecological perspective is that it helps tie together issues of space and time. Aquatic animals use river systems according to developmental stage, time of day, and season. One major reason for this is that stream flow at any point in a river changes at various time steps annually, daily, and even hourly at times of the year. Precipitation drives natural flow fluctuations across a given year, but the flow regime of many river systems has been modified to meet society's needs. So here's an example of a hydrograph that shows flow, reg flow regulation for hydropower production. As you can see, daily stream flow in the Smith River below Philpot Dam in Virginia ranges from about 55 CFS up to 1,500 CFS for a few hours when power is being made and then drops off about every night. These data were collected during August of 2009, and the spikes correspond to demand during the hottest part of the day, especially when everybody gets home from work and flips on their air conditioner. So how does that sort of manipulation affect a river? Well, here's an example, although not specifically in the Smith River. When the turbines are off, the river looks like this, and I've roughed in the margins of the wetted channel with this red line. So do me a favor and pick a rock anywhere in the center of the channel, some rock with water all the way around it, and keep looking at it. When power is being made, stream flow jumps up, and the river now looks like this. Chances are you can't see the rock you were looking at. After demand drops, power generation is curtailed and stream flow drops. So these rapid changes in the course of eight or ten hours have a pretty big effect on stream habitat that critters in that stream and often over time influence its structure and function. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to river ecology and it helps to consider them in a few different dimensions. Vertical, such as the contribution of large and small organic debris from riparian vegetation, as well as the input of sediment from adjacent hill slopes. Longitudinal, which includes the transport and cycling of sediment, nutrients, and organic materials from headwaters on down, or quite simply, water runs downhill. And lateral, the exchange of water and sediment between river and floodplain during overblank, overbank flows, which helps replenish landforms and can recharge aquifers that bracket and underlie the stream. In fact, many aquatic animals count on access to floodplain habitats during some part of their life history. As I mentioned earlier, we group aspects of watershed elements into classification systems that help us describe and predict morphology. In addition, you can look at the flow history of a given river system and gain insight into how precipitation is delivered and processed in a watershed. Similarly, we can use these very same watershed and river attributes to describe and predict riverine communities. River ecologists call this the river continuum concept because the relative physical and hydrological changes along a river from its headwaters on down along that continuum also dictate ecological community distribution. These ecological communities include all organisms and vegetation uh, from algae up to higher vertebrates like fish and amphibians. So using Virginia again as an example, streams in the mountains look a lot like this and brook trout and sculpin are common inhabitants. 
Moving down into the foothills in the Piedmont, we see streams that look like this. And they're inhabited by a more diverse community that includes sunfish and rock bass. Further on into the eastern Piedmont and coastal plain, rivers look like this. And aquatic communities can be much, much more diverse. Common fishes include uh, numerous species of catfish and large diadromous animals like striped bass. So as rivers change, so do the animals that inhabit them. Uh, and just as rivers try to maintain e equilibrium with their watersheds, aquatic communities exist in a dynamic equilibrium with their habitat conditions. As the conditions change, so will the animals. Communities can expand, contract, or blink out within a given river as habitat conditions respond to watershed changes. So combining all of this information into a reach of river allows us to use physical habitat processes and conditions to describe where species and age classes of aquatic animals will reside and where certain types and ages of vegetation could be found. For example, areas where scour and deposition occur creates and maintains spawning gravels, fry and juvenile rearing habitat, and provides colonization sites for riparian vegetation. All right, so I've talked about geomorphic and ecological classification schemes or models, but what about tools that characterize stream condition? Stream assessment methods are intended to make a little more sense out of complicated and somewhat hard to understand graphics like this. I don't like much about this figure or those like it, except to say that they try to illustrate the many factors and interconnected processes that create and maintain the functional health of a stream. Stream assessment methods cram a range of different metrics into a process that funnels a cumulative consideration of many different elements of river science into a single method that describes stream habitat or health or condition. And when you start looking into stream assessment methods, you'll come up with an alphabet soup of acronyms related to various indices, systems, protocols, and procedures. Here are a few gathered from my shelves and past experiences. Like the channel classification methods presented earlier, they each have a range of data requirements, necessary field equipment, and utility. As many of you know, NRCS has its very own stream assessment method known as the Stream Visual Assessment Protocol, or SVAP. Version 2 was completed a few years ago, and I think it does a good job at what it was intended for, a qualitative analysis of a number of river elements that have strong linkages to overall river function and condition. In addition, it allows us to benchmark the condition of a reach of river to either discuss possible management options with the landowner and, when done after completion of a project on the same reach, it helps us illustrate the effects of conservation actions, hopefully in terms of an increased score. Channel classification methods and stream assessment protocols help describe site conditions and provide insight into the relative functional condition of a reach of stream. However, one shortcoming of these tools is they don't necessarily help you figure out what factors conspired to create the conditions you're seeing in the field. Now this can be a problem when you're working on a project where a stream reach appears degraded and landowners are looking for help to address a resource concern or improve stream habitat. Sometimes the range of factors that have historically contributed to stream degradation are indicated by your first visit to a site. In other cases, the range of factors that influence stream condition may not be as apparent. So consider this eroding bank along a stream in a mid-Atlantic state. In addition to what may, have, may be a bank erosion problem, the stream bed exhibits a lack of substrate diversity, pools are wide and shallow, riffles are embedded with fine sediment, and little in-stream and overhead cover provides food and habitat for the critters in the channel. So let's say the landowner's goal is to improve stream habitat, especially to support a population of eastern brook trout that are present along the stream on the property but don't seem to do too well. To maintain a brook trout population, each major life history stanza needs proper habitat. Uh, brook trout have what some call a gravel-to-gravel -gravel life history, meaning that they're born in gravel and thus need gravel as adults to reproduce. Smaller fish, fry and juveniles, need shallow, low-velocity areas underlain by sands and gravels with overhead cover because it offers shelter from bigger predators and supports the types of food items they use to grow and evolve. To reach adulthood, brook trout require riffles composed of coarser material for food production, deep pools as cover from avian predators and refuge during low-flow periods, bankside overhead cover that also produces food, and access to side channel and floodplain habitats as refuge during low excuse me, during high flows. So 
So continuously growing brook trout from eggs to adults in a stream requires functional geomorphic processes in the stream channel. Relating the habitat descriptions I covered in the previous slide in terms of necessary geomorphic functions might look something like this. Coarse sediment, especially cobbles and gravels, needs to be retained and well sorted by stream bed and bank diversity. Alluvial topography should be composed of highs, riffles, and lows, pools, created and maintained by channel dynamics assisted by large woody debris. Overhead cover is a function of balance cut and fill processes that leave behind gravel bars and sloped stream banks where vegetation has year-round access to the water table. And access to lateral and floodplain habitats requires connection between the channel and its adjacent floodplain so that overbank flow occurs with some regularity. So matching up the habitat needs of the species with some of the geomorphic functions necessary to meet those needs leaves you with a list of treatment options that might look something like this. Each of these six bullets, whether singularly or in combination, carries a full range of construction impacts, cost, design requirements, cooperation and input from the landowner, material needs, and regulatory implications. But you've worked your way through most of that stuff and have identified a couple of the best options that seem to fit the landowner's needs, economic situation, species requirement, and logistical sideboards of the site. Things move right along until, perhaps as part of the scoping or regulatory process, additional species at the site are brought into the picture and their habitat requirements or regulatory standing as a threatened or endangered, endangered species make the options you selected less attractive or even hard to pull off because of construction, logistics, work windows, cost, or any other number of issues. And all of a sudden, you feel like you're left with a blank page. Now, this can be a common problem with projects aimed at a single target species. What might benefit one species may produce detrimental effects to one or more other species, even if it's only for a short time during in-stream construction. It's unlikely that you'll be able to develop a prescription for stream habitat management that specifically meets the habitat and ecology of all species in a river. Instead, I'd suggest that working within the context of the watershed, the set of physical and hydrologic conditions that control river structure and function, is really a sweet spot for stream habitat management. In fact, NRCS doesn't really manage species, we manage habitat. Otherwise, we'd have a lot more practice standards to deal with. Uh, working with the river at a site by capitalizing on intact processes will give you the best collection of habitat attributes and will likely improve project stability and success over time. So part of managing stream habitat and an inherent component of stream assessment is to try and figure out how a stream should look, especially if it appears to have degraded conditions. Again, it'd be very difficult to analyze and describe the habitat condition of every organism in the stream. However, identifying geomorphic problems and the conditions that created them can give you a blueprint towards managing for better stream habitat. So assessing stream condition and habitat includes looking along the system and around the watershed to try and gain insight into the factors that contribute to the morphology of a given site. Putting the reach into the context of the watershed will help you, help you do this, as does looking backward in time as much as you possibly can given resources uh, to figure out how past land use history has affected present condition. So not all vertical stream baits are created equally, especially in the eastern United States. This example, based on some groundbreaking research published by Robert Walter and Dorothy Merritt in January of 2008, really challenges conventional wisdom about how stream channels look and act in the Mid-Atlantic region. Some foundational studies in modern fluvial morphology, some performed in this same region, provide the basis for the idea that self-formed channels in fine-grained floodplains generally exhibit a meandering pattern with alternating pools, riffles, and gravel point bars. However, the presence of this dark layer of hydric soils, usually found in wetland settings at the base of what appears to be a floodplain, set Walter and Merritt on a path that provided insight into the profound effect of thousands of historic mill dams on streams and floodplains in the Mid-Atlantic. They suggest that many floodplains along Mid-Atlantic streams are actually fill terraces and that historically incised channels are not natural prototypes for meandering streams. An examination of historic maps and manufacturing census data indicated some 65,000 water-powered mills in the, U in the eastern U.S. by 1840, and that mill densities in some counties were quite high. 
uh, mill dams basically butted up to one another along streams as consecutive features. So in the context of stream management, common structural treatments that address bank erosion have proven to be problematic at sites assumed to be typically incised meandering in streams, but that are in reality inset channels bracketed by old mill pond sediments. Prior to water development for milling purposes and other activities like logging and land clearing for agriculture, these streams were probably characterized as laterally extensive wetland-dominated systems of forested meadows with stable vegetated islands and multiple small channels. So if this is how these streams, quote unquote, should look, a huge outstanding question in systems affected by legacy sediment and mill damming is, can these be restored? And what do we do to restore them? Or what is our restoration target? Some people believe these systems have undergone irreversible geomorphic changes, and others believe the answer lies in, dig lies in digging up and trucking away legacy sediments to allow a natural setting to emerge. That's a big question. So again, as I've suggested in this and other center webinars, I think an essential part of planning for any activity in or along a river includes identifying the context within the river evolved and presently exi exists. You might be getting tired of hearing me say the word context, but I'm going to keep doing it. Now, identifying the stream type or style according to some channel classification scheme will help you identify the habitat template of the system. In addition, Need to factor in the effects of past disturbances over time, accounting for the presence of dams, logging within the watershed, streamside activities like land development and agricultural history, and whether or not the channel has been manipulated at some point in the past. So taking these things into account and describing the context of the basin and reach of the stream you're working on will provide insight into the processes that have been functionally zeroed out and the processes that are still intact. Now, these intact processes provide the best opportunity to encourage habitat formation and landform stability. So the last part of today's show will uh, end with a couple of examples regarding channel manipulation. So many Midwestern states have streams along farm fields with banks that look like this. So a look back in time can often reveal some interesting channel history. Many stream channels in the Midwest were realigned and straightened in an effort to control drainage and to maximize farmable acreage. Here's an example of a reach of stream channelized sometime during the 30s. The red X serves as a registration point to anchor your eye through the next few slides. The stream channel directly adjacent or right of the X is relatively straight, doesn't have many streamside trees, and I would guess that if you could jump in a wayback machine, the stream banks would resemble the previous slide and that habitat would be marginal at best. So some 40 years later, the channel has changed quite a bit. It's assumed a meandering profile pattern, excuse me. The light, unvegetated bands adjacent to the meander bends indicate point bar development, and we're starting to see some streamside vegetation. Jumping ahead another 20 years, the channel has extended and translated its meander pattern. Point bars are more extensive, and streamside vegetation continues to expand. By 2002, we see what appears to be a herbaceous buffer. The meanders are more strongly pronounced. Woody vegetation is more extensive. There appears to be a cutoff channel across the meander neck just to the right of the red X. And the channel has evulsed and abandoned its, its former course at the next meander. But here's a shot from 2007, this time in color. Not a lot of difference between this and the 2002 picture, except that the meander loops have extended and moved down valley a bit, and the riparian corridor appears more robust and continuous. So over the almost 80 years represented by this sequence of aerial photos, the stream has changed dramatically from its channelized condition in the 30s to the meandering system bracketed by a decent riparian corridor we see here on the far right in 2007. Although data aren't available for this stream, I would guess that the quality of habitat along this reach has increased by a couple of orders of magnitude across the period of record represented by these aerials. Now, I have a question for all of you out there. What effect would stream bank stabilization treatments in the early stages of meander development have had on the evolution of this channel and its habitat? I'd be interested, interested to hear any responses at the end of the presentation, or feel free to give me a call or email me. So the final example I'll cover today uh, takes us to Washington State 
to a stream I spent quite a bit of time thinking about and working on years ago, Toppenish Creek on the Yakima Reservation near White Swan. Toppenish Creek drains about 625 square miles of the east slope of the Cascade Mountains in south central Washington. It comes off a high plateau covered with spruce fir forests, travels through ponderosa pine foothills, and then resides in basalt walled canyons until it flows across the Holocene floodplain of the Yakima River. The Toppenish Creek watershed has a long history of logging and irrigated agriculture. I'm going to focus on a reach of the stream in the middle part of the watershed as an example of trying to determine watershed context and capitalizing on intact processes to improve stream habitat. This aerial photo shows the only dam reach of Toppenish Creek in 1949. As you can see, the valley floor had a thick blanket of trees and the actual stream channel is hard to see. However, it basically flowed down the center of the floodplain to the point labeled as only dam. Water was and is to this day diverted at that dam into a canal that feeds alfalfa fields and orchards. In 1974, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in conjunction with Job Corps, attempted to address flooding problems that affected irrigation infrastructure and a nearby residence by channelizing Toppenish Creek along the south side of the floodplain and holding it in that position with an earthen levee. Much of the floodplain vegetation was cleared during this construction activity. Uh, the original alignment of the channel is shown by the light blue line in the center of the photo. The channel responded by incising 10 to 15 feet into the valley floor beyond and sometimes up to the toe of the levee built in 1974. This picture, which was taken in 2001, illustrates channel and habitat conditions that persisted for years in the reach. The channel bed was devoid of pools and overhead cover and composed of a moonscape of large cobbles and small boulders with tiny pockets of gravel throughout. The incised channel pulled the water table down with it, degrading the quality and composition of adjacent floodplain vegetation. Federally threatened steelhead spawned both upstream and downstream of this reach of the creek, but a general lack of suitable spawning gravel made this reach a migration corridor only. But some useful processes were still intact. Logging had been curtailed in the upper watershed, the streamflow regime was unregulated at this point in the system, and there was an abundant supply of coarse sediment moving through the reach coincident with snowmelt generated high flows. In addition, we had authority to make changes in the management and use of the area, as well as a chunk of money to do some work with. As I mentioned, the streamflow regime and an abundant supply of coarse sediment were two intact processes that provided a significant opportunity. Problem was, the straightened over steepened reach didn't provide a setting where this bed load would stick around. The idea was that encouraging deposition will, would allow us to pick up the creek and get it back into contact with the adjacent floodplain, which would one day hopefully create the habitat, the channel morphology, the conditions that, and conditions that were closer to those seen in 1949 before the reach was levied and channelized. So long story short, a series of 11 channel-spanning rock weirs were constructed along the reach in an effort to create a stair-step profile that would decrease slope and create depositional areas for bed load moving through the system. So here's another shot of a couple of those drop stru structures, uh, this time uh, from the air a little bit closer. Now here's a view of the reach from inside the channel. Uh, after the, uh, the drops were built. So these weirs created a series of pools and riffles, raised the water table as much as four feet, and collected large amounts of cobble and gravel. All of the material visible below this drop accumulated during the first runoff season following construction. Stream habitat continues to improve as bed load accumulates and riparian vegetation encroaches the channel. In addition, those threatened steelhead can now spawn and rear in a reach that was once an ecological blank spot along the river corridor. So that's all I have for today, and I really appreciate your time and attention. Um, before I turn this back over to Holly, I'd like to mention, uh, again, as the, one of the opening slides showed, the, this upcoming 2012 webinar schedule. I'm working on one for the end of July. Uh, and the working title, again, is River Science, or Hydrology and Fluid Geomorphology for Non-Engineers. Uh, with that, I'll turn this back over to Holly, and I'd be pleased to hear any questions or comments you have regarding today's webinar.
Uh, thank you very much, Kale. I'll remind folks that they can press star one to get the operator's attention to ask a question. And also you can use the Q&A chat box to type in questions. Uh, we'll hold now and let the operator give further instruction and open up the lines. Thank you very much. Once again, as Holly said, it is star then one to ask a question. You'll be prompted to record your name so I may introduce your question. Once again, star then one to ask a question. One moment, please. And at this time, I have no questions that have come into queue. This is uh, Hank Henry. I'm, I'm here at the uh, Tech Center in Greensboro. Okay, oh, I know SPAS has been used for for a while now. It's been modified. Is there any attempts or is there any plans to update the thing like a version 3? Yes, actually. Uh, good question. My, my buddy Hank always has a good question for me. Um, y you know, I think it's kind of like uh, uh, standards. We're, we're, we're trying to, to be on a schedule to update the thing, you know, every, every five years or so. Uh, the first version was completed in 99 and the last uh, update I think was completed in 07, so obviously more than five years there. But um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back to it, um, you know, within the next couple of years. And of course that process can really be helped by any feedback from folks using it in the field because we did what we could to develop a tool that fits uh, our understanding uh, uh, of how it's used in the field. A number of the folks on the revision work group, work, work group are from field offices. But of course, it's one single tool that's intended to cover uh, the entire area that NRCS works in, which includes the Caribbean and the Pac Basin, which um, is, is a tough place to try to transport ideas from streams in the lower 48. So if you use it, have ideas or, or for improvement or, or problems with its application, uh, it's, it, it, I'd just love to hear whatever you have to say about it, good and bad. Okay, Carol, we're starting to have some questions come in through the Q&A chat. Uh, the first question is, can you please explain the benefits of an OXPO? Oh, okay, I see. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so great question. You know, oxbow channels, quite common in, uh, uh, you know, systems, bigger rivers with wider floodplains um, or even bed load dominated systems. And as a function of their position along the, you know, the geomorphic evolution of the channel, it's a great place uh, for, I guess I'll start with, uh, you know, their effect in, in terms of fish biology. Um, as refuge during high flows, you know, early, early on, uh, as an oxbow is still connected to the main stem of the river, you know, fish can get in there. Uh, and because it's a, a quasi floodplain feature, you, you know, it's, it's, port, it's sort of half riverine and half floodplain at the time a river abandons it. Um, it's a great place to get out of what can be pretty challenging conditions in the main channel during high flow events. Uh, the other thing is, again, as that channel fills in and vegetation encroaches it, um, you, you know, there's a point in time, especially, again, in the context of rearing, small-bodied fish can get in there and large-bodied fish can't. So it's a great place to grow. Another aspect would be uh, the thermal regime of an oxbow channel. Um, quite often, especially, uh, you, you know, if they're only seasonally connected to the river, uh, the water in that channel comes from groundwater. Um, and, you know, groundwater, if it's popping from a shallow alluvial system, you know, can have a mean annual temperature that's usually related to the mean annual air temperature. So it can be an awful lot cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. So again, it provides uh, a relatively stable environment um, for uh, fish and other aquatic organisms. Next question, Kale. Uh, this one uh, is coming in from Montana, I believe. The question is, who should we contact in Montana to evaluate stream bank deterioration on the Missouri? <laughs> the core. Uh, you know, and that, uh, forgive my flippant answer, but 
I guess from a management perspective, and it's been a while since I've been in Montana in a professional sense, um, but, you know, commonly DEQs, State Departments of Environmental Quality or Environmental whatever, you, you know, commonly track or have tools to address stream bank erosion primarily as a function of fine sediment delivery. So that would be, you know, in, in most states of the East, uh, you know, a lot of them have methods or metrics or performance measures uh, pointed at stream banks for that very purpose, especially in terms of Clean Water Act issues and, and especially fine sediment. So uh, that would be, uh, I guess, my first answer is to, and, and I can start looking around uh, to see if the state's got anything uh, on that. Uh, there are a number of folks at, at universities there. There's a fellow named... Uh, Bill Locke at Montana State, who's an excellent geomorphologist. So if the stream bank erosion issue is 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 sort of uh, one of those that might have some complex reasons or some, some differing opinions as to why a stream bank's eroding, maybe it's good to bring in a university type. Uh, uh, and I guess my final answer would be um, contact your MEO geologist uh, because you know, especially folks in that part of the world, uh, quaternary geology plays a huge uh, part in the understanding and prediction of, of dynamics and river systems in that part of the world. And a geologist would be able to lend some really useful insight into what you might be seeing in a particular reach of river. Okay, Kale. Uh, using the context of southern Indiana, uh, woody debris is causing problems with channel erosion, flooding, and blocking migration in our area. Uh, this, this person asking this question, we would like to develop a woody debris management plan. Do you have any suggestions? Well, that's one issue, obviously, that is a hot button uh, anywhere you go. In fact, our former channel, or excuse me, channel, uh, Center Director Carolyn Adams um, encouraged me early on to look at developing uh, a guideline or a uh, white paper on wood removal and streams. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, I've talked with some of my colleagues in the Forest Service and, and tried to, uh, especially the folks that are really good at, at, at adding wood back into streams and say, hey, you know, I know this sounds sort of kind of, you know, crazy given what you do, but could you, would you ever think about helping to develop guidelines for wood removal? It's a part of what we do. Um, you know, obviously, large woody debris in a stream system uh, in the wrong place can wreak havoc. I'll spot you that. Um, in other settings, uh, you, you know, uh, self-formed or natural log jams uh, uh, don't necessarily block passage. Now that's another one of those hot button issues that is open to debate and, and again this is kind of weird. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a phone and looking at some words on a computer. So if, if you would like to give me a call and talk a little bit more about this issue, I, I'd really like it because this one is, is complex. Uh, it's got an awful lot of different answers but the, the final answer I have, uh, Alex, is that guidance does exist, uh, and it's primarily from Australia. Uh, those folks, uh, there's a number of researchers that have gone in and looked at, uh, by removing all of the wood in treatment reaches of stream, literally how much can you remove, uh, where can it be removed from, and where should it be left alone? And I think that's sort of at the essence of the question of, of taking wood out of channels. Um, is to set forth a set of rules, you know, that try to kind of walk that fine line between addressing uh, environmental or, or social or uh, uh, land ownership impacts, yet uh, preserving some semblance of ecology. Okay, next question. Rather than removal of legacy sediments, has NRCS had any success in restoring a braided stream through fine-grained sediment in place? Linda. I'm going to say, who asked, who asked that's Linda? Hi, Linda. You know, I am unaware 
of uh, of any NRCS projects that fit your sideboards. And uh, I, 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 I know of a couple of projects done, you know, out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, braided, braided streams uh, moving through uh, Missoula flood deposits, and uh, it, it was a combination, uh, probably like a 70-30, 70% reveg, 30% uh, very well thought out and and strategically placed in stream structures to to basically get the river channel to interact with the material and transport and promote the regeneration of vegetation. Okay, this question is from William, and William asks, any thoughts on the use of gabions for stream <laughs> restoration? Any thoughts, William? Yes, gabions. gabions. Uh, well, William, you know, uh, uh, gabions and I have had a long history, uh, it, it, to, the, to the extent I've had much of a history. Um, you know, I, I know the... Uh, uh, the, the, the famous Dr. Rosgen likes to call them time-release bed load capsules. Uh, and I think, uh, you, you know, my, my answer is, is two-part. Uh, I've worked in a lot of very modified stream environments. And in some cases where you need an awful lot of stability in a very small footprint, um, you know, gabions have a, have a place, especially if you have, you know, access issues, uh, the supply of larger material uh, 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 nearby it is lacking. Um, you know, those things can be built and, 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 and put together and, and stuck along a creek uh, in relatively short order. Uh, problems, again, have, as you're probably aware of, been observed in many places. Um, even if you use PVC uh, coated wire, especially in streams that have a high bed load transport rate, you know, those, those, that, that coating can get uh, knocked off, rust takes over, and, and then, of course, in time, the wire lets go. And, and, and again, if the, if, the, if the toe of a gabion wall starts to deteriorate, uh, uh, the whole thing can come down. Another, er, early on, you know, gabions were used all over the place. I'm aware of a couple of fish, patch, uh, fish passage projects where gabions were used in the Rocky Mountains of south-central Wyoming, uh, Battle Creek. And, um, you know, they were used in the place of boulders to create uh, uh, drops, you know, to create a stair-step profile, not unlike the one that I showed from Washington State. Um, and at low flow, when larger fish were trying to get over the gabions that had been there for a few years, um, you know, they were, they were really interacting with some sharp uh, ends of, of rusty wire, and, and there were some concerns from the game and fish that... Uh, you know, that there was actually injury there. So it's another one of those sort of questions that I think has uh, uh, got an awful lot of different uh, answers and, and facets to it, um, but I guess that's what came off the top of my head right now. Okay, that looks like that's it for the Q&A through the uh, chat box. Uh, operator, are we having any more of the audio questions, or have we tapped out on those? At this point, no one has queued up to ask the question. Okay, well, with that, we're going to conclude today's webinar. Up on the screen, you'll see that we have options for downloading the replay for Kale's presentation. I believe today there were several uh, participants that are uh, from the general public or outside the NRCS family. And if you are one of those people and you would like to download the presentation file, the uh, replay of the webinar, then you can go to the first link on the slide there uh, under our East NTSC webinar page. Or if you're an NRCS employee and you would like to get these uh, files, then you should visit the NRCS Science and Technology Training Library. And again, the uh, shortened URL is at the very bottom of this slide. Uh, and in conclusion, I'd like to invite you back for our next webinar. It will take place on Wednesday, February 29th, 2 o'clock Eastern. The lead on that topic is Kevin Ogles. He's our grazing land specialist here at the center. And the title of the presentation is Essential Principles for Conservation Planning on Pastures. And with that, we'll conclude. And thank you very much for your participation today. And thanks, Kale, for another great webinar. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody.
That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation.